1953, the United States started to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe to support NATO against a growing Soviet threat. This deployment provided the impetus for an unprecedented effort to provide security for these weapons of last resort. As early as 1960, it was clear that innovative safety and control devices would be necessary to meet U.S. and NATO political and military requirements. It was critical that nuclear weapons would always be available for use if and only if authorized by the president. And they must never be subject to unauthorized use and must never detonate in an accident. The design features to ensure the safety, security, and reliability now associated with U.S. nuclear weapons did not happen overnight. The significant role of the national laboratories and that deliberate process is the subject of this documentary. Always, never. Investigate unidentified object. Exit controller to blue lead. Clear to roll. The assumption was Europe could be defended in one and only one way, and that was through the use of nuclear weapons. In Thule, Greenland, a nuclear bomber crashed, and if that had led to a nuclear explosion, beyond just a scattering of nuclear materials, we would have been very close on the edge of um, nuclear uh, war by accident. The initial weapons that were deployed were for the 280 millimeter cannon. And then shortly after that, there was uh, quite a uh, variety of weapons that were deployed that included not only the nuclear artillery, but the surface to surface pistols. Uh, there were dual capable aircraft. There were air defense artillery, and there was also atomic demolition munitions. Nuclear weapons got at the heart of NATO strategy very quickly from their initial deployment in 1953. Although the exact role, uh, exactly how and when they were going to be used, was often confusing and ambiguous. historic day for America as president... In 1953, President Eisenhower would make nuclear weapons the centerpiece of national defense and the defense of Western Europe. Eisenhower decided that we were spending too much on the Department of Defense and cut back the planned level of expenditures. This was the new look. Uh, we in the judgment of the administration, could not stand up against the hordes of Soviet soldiers that would be sent against the West. And therefore, nuclear weapons were a substitute for maintaining massive conventional forces. The nuclearization of NATO was codified in MC-48, a seminal planning document declaring that NATO forces would be able to initiate immediate defensive and retaliatory operations, including the use of atomic weapons. MC-48 also called for the development of forces in being, underscoring the importance of a German contribution. Memories of World War II were very fresh. And so for NATO to make that decision to allow Germany to rearm uh, it was a very difficult one. It almost took the whole world to bring Germany down in 1945. And it is this huge, huge weight 
in the balance of power, and, and East and West are just really, really worried about which way that, that power, that country's going to go. That was the linchpin of the Cold War, was whether West Germany would stay firmly in the Western camp or perhaps have some degree of movement toward a sort of a detente with the Warsaw Pact and with the Soviet Union. But the Allies remained committed to a Germany friendly to the West. By integrating West Germany within a system of European defense based on American nuclear power, NATO believed that German power could be contained. In October 1954, the Allies agreed to make West Germany a member of NATO, and in May 1955, bound by treaty, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer vowed that the Federal Republic of Germany would not produce or possess nuclear weapons. And our job was to ensure that they felt that we could deter Warsaw Pact attack, to assure that the prospect of the war fighting would not uh, uh, be so uh, frightening that uh, the political support for deterrence and for NATO would erode. NATO air forces must be alert at all times. To give them realistic training, a vast maneuver is held in June. Exercise carte blanche in the skies over western Germany. 3,000 aircraft from 11 nations take part. NATO's first war game involving tactical nuclear weapons was intended to demonstrate U.S. resolve and commitment. Twelve installations of the defending Fourth Allied Tactical Air Force are hit, four of them by simulated atomic bombs. Instead, the exercise exposed inherent contradictions of the nuclear battlefield. In the course of the exercise, there were 335 nuclear weapons dropped. There was an estimated five million casualties, uh, most of these in Germany. I used to fly over it with some of the Seventh Army people. It would be bad enough with so-called conventional capabilities, but nothing compared to what would happen if we had started using nuclear weapons. A difficulty, of course, was that those battlefield nuclear weapons would be used on German soil. And over time, the Germans would get increasingly restless about the way we were protecting them. The contradictions of the Cold War were well established by Eisenhower's second inaugural. Nuclear weapons would come to be seen as the glue that held NATO together, while their deterrent role would remain confusing and ambiguous. Soon, a second generation of tactical and strategic nuclear weapons would be dispersed in NATO, raising concerns not only about strategy, but also about nuclear safety and control. A new Middle East crisis arises as President Nasser of Egypt tells a wildly cheering crowd in Alexandria that Egypt has seized the internationally owned Suez Canal. Encircled by units from 15 Red Armor divisions that have poured into Hungary, patriots fight to the last ditch. This is the death of liberty in Budapest. Against a backdrop of increasing east-west tensions, and despite deep ambivalence toward battlefield nuclear weapons, NATO planning proceeded apace, and in May 1957, the North Atlantic Council approved a new strategic document. MC-14-2, the massive retaliation strategy, was all that nuclear war. It was nothing short of that. So there was no distinction between tactical and strategic. Everything was going to be used. U.S. nuclear weapons deployed in Europe and closely coupled with forces of the Strategic Air Command would provide NATO with extended nuclear deterrence. Extended deterrence was challenged from Europe by Charles de Gaulle and others when Charles de Gaulle said, will the Americans sacrifice New York for Hamburg? Whether it was de Gaulle or uh, the British or the, uh, the Germans who didn't really believe that they could count on us for that sort of thing. America wouldn't be able to rely on the threat of deliberately, consciously launching a full-scale nuclear attack on the Soviet Union indefinitely. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. 
one of the great scientific feats of the age. I think people felt that the Soviets were speeding ahead of us in some sense. During the Suez venture, Khrushchev threatened to rain rockets down on Paris and London. Well, he didn't have the rockets to rain down on them at the time, but the Soviets were engaged in exaggerating their capabilities, and to some extent, that influenced our perception. To a large extent, that influenced our perception. It was very easy to move to a worst case mentality and think, oh my God, they're gonna go into production uh, very rapidly and soon have a very large ICBM force. Top secret reconnaissance of the Soviet Union would gradually undermine Khrushchev's boasts of missile superiority and bolster Eisenhower's confidence in the US strategic deterrent. But lacking this new intelligence, NATO political and military leaders shared the public's alarm. Eisenhower didn't want America to be the protector of Europe. So anything that pointed toward uh, an independent, strategically independent, unified Europe, you know, fit in with the Eisenhower policy. Now that clearly meant that the Europeans would have to be armed with nuclear weapons. The idea was to share the nuclear burden and, and also complicate the planning for a Soviet first strike. It'd be that much harder for them to overrun NATO if the nuclear retaliation capacity was spread across more countries. At the 1957 Emergency Summit, Eisenhower agreed to establish a NATO atomic stockpile and offered to station intermediate range ballistic missiles at European bases. These IRBMs would be capable of reaching targets in the Soviet Union and were to be a stopgap until America's intercontinental ballistic missiles were ready. Congress had authorized this nuclear development on the proviso that U.S. would maintain custody of the nuclear weapon. But what did custody mean if the nuclear weapon was hanging under the wing of a German airplane piloted by a German pilot sitting on the tarmac ready to go. And on those bases, we had weapons, our weapons. And they were on a, what was called a quick reaction alert. Four airplanes were supposed to be, when they got the word, be airborne in five minutes. In every case where weapons were deployed to a specific NATO site, there was a U.S. custodial presence. A few individuals, generally young custodians, that, had con that were the legal control of the weapons embedded with, let's say, the German army. I can remember in the tour of NATO around 1958 that it would be very easy for the host nation or some faction in that nation to take over the nuclear facility. There was concern about foreign nationals, but also about commanders that might use them without proper authority. And of course, the European commander, who was an American commander, was eager to have them under his own control. But if nuclear war was fought, it would be fought with central US systems in according to plan and not in reaction to uh, an event in the theater. In order to be sure of that, there had to be something a little bit better in a crisis situation. In 1958, as John Foster advanced the concept of use control at Livermore, Fred Clay was presenting a confidential report to his colleagues at RAND on the risk of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear detonation. About that time, we started the alert of our bomber force because of the fear of surprise attack, that the bombs could be destroyed on the ground before they took off. But then it occurred to me, you know, uh, a deliberate attack is only one problem we have. If there's an accidental nuclear launch, you cannot dissuade an accident from happening. You have to prevent the accident. We had two basic recommendations. One was a two-man rule. 
At that time, one uh, authorized uh, sergeant from the Air Force uh, could move around a bomb that he could have brought to detonation. He might be psychotic, he might be alcoholic, he might be going through a terrible divorce, uh, he may be sleep deprived and make a, a mistake in the way he's carrying out nuclear weapon safety rules. You need a second person to ensure that these kinds of normal, natural human foibles don't cause some kind of nuclear accident or launch. So we recommended that not just relying on screening of the people in a two-man rule, but also on safety locks, to put it simply. It was a lock that would in turn this otherwise ready-to-go nuclear weapon into a dumb bomb until a code was inserted. And so it is a electrical break or a functional break of critical functions that are in the weapon. An acute need for change in nuclear safeguards and security was emerging independently within the defense community. By 1960, U.S. nuclear weapons were widely deployed to Europe, and Strategic Air Command was preparing for a full-time airborne alert mission. This posture of extended deterrence and high readiness carried with it new risks. Soon, action by Congress and the White House would crystallize around the concept of a coded lock for nuclear weapons that became known as the Permissive Action Link. There were three groups that separately stumbled their way onto thinking we needed something like a permissive action link. One was the labs themselves, then there was the executive branch, and the third group was in Congress, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And the fortunate thing is they all came together at the same time, the late 50s, early 60s. 57 to 62 was a period of, of drastic change to the nuclear arsenal particularly after weapons were placed on quick reaction alert uh, in Europe and in the United States. The customer, the military, wanted smaller devices, lighter, uh, lighter devices. And so the Los Alamos folks invented the idea of a sealed pit. When we developed what were called seal pit weapons, these were weapons where the fissile material was an integral part of the high explosive assembly mechanism. With sealed pits, you then were in a situation where the bomb was always ready to go. Now, as designs evolved and we went to seal pit, when all of the energy sources necessary were in one place, we didn't at first recognize the implications on the electrical system. We need some mechanism to protect us from that electrical energy that stops the flow of electrical energy directly into your, your charging system. In 1958, nuclear safety was an emerging discipline at the Atomic Energy Commission laboratories, and designers at Sandia were challenged to ensure the handling safety of the new sealed pit weapons. This pioneering effort in safety would pave the way for the first permissive action link. One of the things that was done was to try to include in the weapons some device that would determine the weapon was in the actual use environment. That is a device that would maintain a, a degree of electrical isolation within the warhead's electrical system until such time as the weapon sees a unique delivery environment. There is a class of weapon type called ADM, Atomic Demolition Munitions. These munitions were implanted just like a landmine. They had no environment to sense. The storage environment and the use environment were the same. They were just sitting there. And so the Army and the Marines chose to use a three-digit coded lock. 